back to the medical report. Our guest speaker uh, is Dr. Chet Simmons, an orthopedic surgeon from Chester County Hospital and, and the Chester County Orthopedic Group. This second segment is going to be dedicated to hip and replacement and knee replacement. And so with that introduction, we'll begin and ask uh, Dr. Simmons to talk a little bit about total hip replacement. Well, hip replacement is really one of the most successful operations uh, that's out there. Uh, the statistics show that, that patient satisfaction and improvement in their function is, is really well proven. Um, when the hip joint wears out, basically the ball and socket have no more lubrication and they are rubbing bone against bone. When we do a replacement, uh, the procedure is to insert a prosthesis, a new ball and socket. And the way we do that is to remove the damaged ball and then insert a prosthesis. And on this model, I can show a hip joint. And in the femur bone, there normally would be a ball here that articulates with the socket. So in the procedure, an incision is made on the side of the hip, typically. The ball is removed. And then a, a stem is inserted that's made of titanium, typically. It has a rough surface on which the bone will actually grow and anchor the prosthesis uh, down the road. And the prosthesis is fitted into the bone cavity very tightly, and then it anchors itself biologically. And we can put various size and shape hip balls on top. The socket is also a metal socket that is fitted into the pelvis and has a bearing surface, typically of polyethylene plastic. And when those are put together, a smooth gliding joint is restored. Now that is a, this, this prosthesis is, is made out of what the hip? The metallic the, components are made of titanium. And the ball is? The ball is typically made of a stainless steel, stainless but it, steel. it can be made of other materials uh, for certain circumstances. Okay. Now, in, in the procedure itself, <clears throat> what is the length of time that most of these procedures take? In experienced hands, the surgery takes only about an hour, um, maybe an hour and a half. Um, patients are typically in the hospital for anywhere from two to three days. But we get our patients up walking that afternoon or the next morning. So they're, they're moving right away. So the post-operative recovery period is, 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 is the next step in, in, in the, I guess, the rehabilitation. Uh, what, what do the patients do uh, to try to accelerate that? Well, in the hospital, we get patients up right away. We feel that moving quickly is important. Typically, they're on a walker or crutches for anywhere from two to four weeks, and then they use a cane for a month or so for balance. Uh, patients in the hospital are walking the hallway and even climbing stairs slowly, uh, but climbing stairs before they leave the hospital. Many patients can go directly home from the hospital uh, with a visiting nurse or home therapy, but some patients will go to a rehab center for a few days for extra therapy. Now, people are always interested, of course, in, in complications and, and safety and patient safety and so forth. What are some of the things you do for patient safety so that people feel comfortable when they go in for this procedure? Well, that's a big issue, particularly in joint replacement. The big complications that we want to avoid are infection, of course, uh, and blood clots. Those are two that are unique, uh, not unique, but common with joint replacement. For infection, we're sure to use uh, antibiotics uh, around the time of surgery. We operate in special clean air operating rooms with space suits that isolate the surgeon and the surgical team from uh, the patient, so that it cuts down the amount of bacteria. And we use some type of blood thinner. There are various choices for a period of time after surgery to cut down the risk of blood right. clots. So there's a lot of things done to, to make this as safe as possible, which is a big issue with, with any surgical procedure, and in particular orthopedics. Um, when someone has a, a hip replaced, how long is that going to last me? Well, the, the old hip replacements traditionally would last anywhere from 15 to 20 years. And the weak link is the polyethylene bearing surface. That's what wears out, much like the tread on a tire. Um, today, the polyethylene bearing that we have has 90% less wear than it used to. So uh, we're hoping that this is going to last most patients their lifetime. 
Uh, there are certain other circumstances, a very young patient who may be in their 40s, where we will use an advanced bearing surface, such as a ceramic ball, like is depicted here, that may have less wear. But we tell most patients it's probably going to la last uh, decades at this point. Is there any uh, slippage or anything of the, any of these parts uh, frequently or not frequently? It's unusual. Occasionally, <clears throat> a part will come loose or wear out, and patients require maintenance surgery. Um, but as we get better and better and the designs improve, that's less and less common. Now, what are the outcomes in general, statistically, for, for hip surgery? Uh, well, the, the, the statistics show that about 90 to 95 percent of the prostheses will last 15 to 20 years. Um, the complication rates are pretty low. The risk of infection nationally is around 2 percent, which is a big deal if, if you're the person that gets it, but it's a fairly unusual condition. Uh, the, the risk of a fatal blood clot is also very low, 1 or 2 percent. So most patients are very, very happy and avoid major complications. And these folks have to be sure, for example, their, their, their teeth are safe and so forth and all that before they go to surgery, correct? That's correct. Any either. potential yep. sources of infection, yep. we try to identify ahead of time. We have patients get a dental checkup right. uh, to make sure there are no sources of infection. So all these preoperative clearances have to be done uh, on a regular basis. And they're important. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we'll move on now to the knee. And uh, the knee is always a, a little bit more complex in my mind than the hip, but probably not you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a little more complex, okay. and anatomically, yes. Yeah, okay. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the procedure that you, you perform for knee replacement? Well, a knee replacement uh, is really more of a resurfacing of the joint. Uh, many of my patients have this vision in their mind that we're going to go and chop the knee out and put a mechanical hinge in, and that's not exactly what we do. Um, the prosthesis for a knee is really a cap that goes on the end of the bone of the femur and the tibia, and that gives it a new smooth gliding surface, and in between there's a polyethylene bearing, much like the hip, that acts as the cartilage and cushion in there and it's done through an incision in the front of the knee. Um, the muscles and ligaments that support the knee are all maintained at the end, so they're still there operating the joint. Now, is there anything that's different about the surgical uh, preparation and so forth for knee surgery than there is for hip surgery? It, it, the preparation and the, the actual experience is very similar, and the recovery is very similar. I think what's different about the knee replacement is that it requires a lot more physical therapy and hard work in order to get the, the knee moving. And if patients aren't willing to do the therapy and endure some discomfort, they end up with a stiff knee and maybe unhappy. Okay. Is there anything peculiar to, say, to the knee prosthesis as opposed to the hip prosthesis as far as uh, outcomes are concerned? I think the outcomes are pretty similar. Uh, the longevity of the prosthesis is similar and the patient satisfaction numbers are very close. And tell our viewers a little bit about uh, the recovery period you mentioned just briefly that it was a little bit longer. Uh, what specifically do these folks do in the forms for therapy? What, what is the process? I think w with the hip patients, the, the difficulty is moving around, learning to get in and out of bed, climb stairs, but there's not a lot of active therapy to work on the range of motion and so forth at the beginning. With a knee, that range of motion and strengthening starts right away, the first day, uh, because if there's a delay, scar tissue will form and the joint will really stiffen up. And I think patients have to be mentally prepared to work a little harder with a knee replacement in general. Okay. Now I think that, I think you've covered the, uh, the total hip replacement and total knee replacement I think pretty clearly and I, I hope everybody understands exactly how it was done. I'd like to move on to some of the modifications of, of surgical procedures that, that you're familiar with. Uh, we're talking about hip, we'll first talk about hip resurfacing. Sure. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, hip resurfacing is a new procedure in, in the United States. It's been here for three or four years. It's been done in Europe for many years before that. 
And the, the theory is it may be a little bit uh, more conservative and bone conserving, and it may potentially last longer than a traditional hip replacement. And in this model, you can see the difference between the two. With the hip resurfacing, instead of removing the damaged ball, we just place a small cap, which if I can remove it here, on top. So we, we shape the end of the femur bone, and then we place this cap and stem on top that makes it smooth again. And what's a little bit different is that the socket prosthesis is all metal. So the joint ends up being a metal on metal bearing, which sounds like it would be rough and, and squeak, but actually it's very smooth and very durable. Uh, this may allow patients to be a lot more active, and it's designed for that young, active patient. For example, I have a, a gentleman who's in his late 40s, who's a nationally ranked singles tennis player that had this procedure done and was able to maintain his standing. Um, there are some concerns about this technology. There have been a few reports of problems with the metal bearings. Some patients are allergic to metal bearings, and if they get uh, a wear reaction to this, it can cause pain and swelling and dysfunction of the joint. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're conservative about using this. It's a promising new technology, but there's still some questions out there. What is the composition of the metal, do you know? The metal is a chrome cobalt alloy. Okay. Um, and it has to be that way because titanium is a soft metal that is not designed for a bearing surface. It's very strong, but it's not hard. Now, the, is there anything different between the, say, the longevity of, of, of these and the total well, joint? Well, theoretically, this metal-on-metal -metal bearing may last longer, but we don't have studies to prove that yet. We have laboratory studies that show lower wear, um, but it's a little bit up in the air, and I, I make sure patients are aware of that if we're deciding to proceed. Yeah. All right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit at the end of this uh, about what is frequently called minimally invasive surgery. Everybody's heard about minimally invasive surgery, particularly with the introduction of laparoscopic procedures and, and so forth. Where are you in orthopedic surgery with this? That's a big hot topic. Everybody yeah. that comes to my office wants a minimally invasive operation with a one-inch incision, and uh, that's not always possible. Our philosophy is to make the incision as small as we can, but to make it big enough to do the job correctly. And the way I look at it is we're trying to put in a prosthesis that's going to last the patient 20, 30 years, we hope. So what if they get out of the hospital a day later because their incision is a little bit bigger? You want the carpentry work and the, and the surgical job to be done properly and not have the implant loosen or wear out. Um, we see cases of surgeons trying to do a big operation through a tiny incision and they do a poor job. They put the prosthesis in inappropriately and it fails. Has anybody attempted doing any kind of robotic surgery? There, there was some work with that. Um, what we're doing now is a lot of preoperative computer guidance where we will okay. have a custom prosthesis made preoperatively using an MRI scan that will fit the patient potentially more accurately. And that, uh, I understand you, the uh, company, you send your scans to the company and they, they customize the that's joint, correct. is that correct? Correct, and that's also promising but, but as yet unproven. Unproven, that's very good. Well, I think we've uh, covered a lot of very interesting topics and uh, I want to thank Dr. Simmons for joining us today. Uh, I hope everybody understands a little more uh, at the end of the session than they did before, uh, what the indications for surgery are. Uh, what the surgery is and what the complications are, what we try to do to prevent the complications, and what's coming along as new procedures, hopefully down the line. So we thank you very much for joining us. My and, pleasure. Uh, uh, hope to see you again sometime with some other procedures. Absolutely. Thank you.